Welcome to Orbital Dynamics Part 2. In this part, I want to review some basic math that we use later on. I'll start with some basics here, and we'll get into more advanced math in the later parts. I'm a big fan of Saul Khan and have myself listened to several of his videos. When he does algebraic derivations, he doesn't skip steps. I intend to do the same. Seeing how these equations are derived gives you a better intuition into what they do. Orbital dynamics involves a lot of equations that you can simply plug and chug values into. You'll get the right results, but you won't understand the theory behind them. The intent of this course is to give you some intuition as to what the equations mean. The orbital dynamics textbooks assume that you already know undergraduate math. When I first looked at these textbooks, I was overwhelmed. It had been many years since I'd been in a university classroom. I'm, going to, I'm also going to show you some of the tools I use to work up several of the animations in this course. If you want to understand this well, you should set up your own models and animations. There's no substitute for that. I'm going to start coordinate systems. In orbital dynamics, we're going to plot points on a graph. In order to do that, we need a coordinate system. Rene Descartes developed a right-handed coordinate system we refer to as the Cartesian coordinate system. In its two-dimensional form, it has an x and y axis. In the three-dimensional form, there's a z axis. If I move the point A around, the x and y values change. As this animation shows, I can plot any point with an x value and a y value. As I move the point B around, you can see how x and y vary. If I move the point below the horizontal axis, the y value goes negative. Likewise, if I move the point to the left of the vertical y-axis, the x value goes negative. I can plot any point in a two-dimensional plane with this x-y Cartesian coordinate system. The Cartesian coordinate system in three dimensions is a right-handed system because the x and y and z axes go along the middle index and thumb fingers of your right hand. Orbital dynamics deals with things that rotate and things that orbit. A rectangular coordinate system is not right for orbital dynamics. Instead, we use what's called a polar coordinate system. This coordinate system is made up of concentric circles and radial lines. Here's a point P in the polar coordinate system. Notice that the coordinates on the right are a scalar length and an angle. This coordinate system um, also has two values, but with this system, it's the angle and um, it's the length and the angle of the line segment with respect to the horizontal axis. This coordinate system can also plot a point anywhere in a two dimensional plane. When we measure angles, we don't use degrees, we use radians. The point P on this diagram has a length of one and an angle in radians of one. I've constrained the point P so that it only moves along this circle. Since the circle has a radius of one, we call it a unit circle. Here I've drawn an arc along the unit circle that has a one radius arc length, which for the unit circle is one unit of length. That's the definition of a radian. It's the angle that corresponds to an arc that is one radius long. We're used to angles in degrees. A right angle is 90 degrees. In radians, that angle is pi over two. 180 degrees is pi radians. 270 is 3 pi over 2 radians, and 360 or 1 full revolution is 2 pi radians. The circumference of a circle is pi times the diameter, or 2 pi times r, the radius. 1 full revolution in radians is thus 2 pi radians. Here I'm showing a circle with greater than one radius. Since the radius is larger, the length of the arc that equates to one radians is also larger, but it's still a one radian angle. I've added a calculation in this video, the angle over pi. That's the angle expressed as a number of pi radians. In orbital dynamics, we usually express angles as a multiple of pi. A 180 degree angle is pi radians, and a 360 degree angle is two pi radians. Let's go over basic trigonometry. I'm showing you a right triangle with an angle theta at the top. The side along the y-axis is adjacent to the angle theta. The side along the x-axis is opposite to the angle theta. And the hypotenuse is the longest side of the triangle and is opposite the right angle. 
Here I'm measuring the lengths of the side of um, here I'm measuring the lengths of the side and I'm measuring the angle theta. We know from the Pythagorean theorem that the square root of the adjacent side plus the opposite side squared is the length of the hypotenuse. The cosine of the angle theta is the adjacent over the hypotenuse. And for a 0 0.93 radian angle, the cosine is 0 0.6. The sine of theta is the opposite of the hypotenuse. For a 0 0.93 radian angle, the sine is 0 0.8. The tangent of theta is the opposite of the adjacent. For a 0 0.93 angle, the tangent is 1.33. I can change the angle theta by changing the length of the adjacent side. I can also change the angle theta by changing the length of the opposite side. The only thing that must remain constant is the angle at the origin. It always has to be 90 degrees. As I change the angle, the lengths of the three sides of the triangle change, and thus the cosine, sine, and tangent function values change. These are the basic trigonometric functions. There are also inverse and reciprocal functions. The cosecant is 1 over the cosine. This equates the hypotenuse over the adjacent. The secant is 1 over the sine. This equates the hypotenuse over the opposite. The cotangent is 1 over the tangent. This equates to the adjacent over the opposite. The inverse cosine takes the ratio of the adjacent over the hypotenuse hypotenuse as its input and gives you the angle theta. The inverse sine takes the ratio of the opposite over hypotenuse as its input and gives you the angle theta. And the inverse tangent takes the ratio of the opposite over the adjacent and as its input and also gives you the angle theta. Sometimes we know the angle and we want to know the length of the side and sometimes we know the lengths and want to know the angle. We'll use all these functions throughout orbital dynamics. Planets and satellites and even stars orbit along ellipses. I'm going to get into ellipses later. The ancients used to think everything orbited in circles. The circle is actually one instance of ellipse, so they weren't totally wrong. In fact, the Earth's orbit is very nearly circular. In describing the geometry of orbiting bodies, we often start with circles since the math is much simpler. It's an easier step to then progress to ellipses. This is a unit circle plotted in a rectangular Cartesian coordinate system. You can tell that it's a unit circle because the radius is 1, and the circle crosses the y-axis at 1 and minus 1, and crosses the x-axis at 1 and minus 1. I'll put a point P on the circle here. The x-y coordinates of P is 0 0.6 and 0 0.8. I'm going to draw a line segment along the x-axis here and then one in the y direction here. This forms a right triangle. The angle here is a right 90 degree angle. I'll measure the hypotenuse. This is a unit circle, so it's always equal to one. And I'll measure the angle theta. I'll measure the length of the side adjacent to theta. It equals 0 0.6. And I'll measure the length of the side opposite to theta. It equals 0 0.8. The adjacent over the hypotenuse is 0 0.6. That means the cosine of theta is 0 0.6. Remember that the hypotenuse equals 1, which makes these calculations trivial. The opposite of the hypotenuse is 0 0.8. Thus, the sine of theta is 0 0.8. If we want to know the, angle, the value of the angle theta, we use the inverse cosine. I can do that with a calculator. It equals 0 0.93 radians. If I measure the angle theta, I get the same result. The polar coordinates for P are thus 1 and 0 0.93 radians. The tangent is the opposite over the adjacent. That equals 1.33, which is the tangent of theta. If I move P along the unit circle, notice that while the values change, the length of the opposite always equals the sine of theta, and the length of the adjacent always equals the cosine of theta. This holds true if I move P into the next coordinate system quadrant. Notice here that the cosine of theta is now negative. In this quadrant, both cosine and sine theta are negative. 
and here only the sine of theta is negative. Here we go back to the original position of P. I'm now going to increase the size of the, of the circle, so this is no longer a unit circle. With polar coordinates, notice that the angle didn't change, but the length did. Also, notice that the length of the adjacent is no longer equal to the cosine of theta, and the length of the opposite is no longer equal to the sine of theta. Let's label the hypotenuse R, which stands for radius. The lengths of these line segments are R cosine theta and R sine theta. And I'll show these calculations. Now when I change the circle, when I change the size of the circle, R cosine theta equals the length of the adjacent and R sine theta equals the length of the opposite. If I go back to the unit circle, the length of the line segments is simply cosine theta and sine theta because r equals 1. I'm now switching to a polar coordinate system. I'm no longer plotting p with x and y coordinates. I can derive them, however. The x coordinate is r cosine theta and the y coordinate is r sine theta. I've just shown you how we transform coordinates from polar coordinates to rectangular x, y coordinates. This transformation where x equals r cosine theta and y equals r sine theta is used extensively. I want to do this algebraically. Let's put a point here on the circle. This line segment represents the radius, which we'll label r. If we drop a line from this point on the circle, we get the x value of the point at the end of the black line segment. If we draw a horizontal line, we get the y value. Let's move the, y, the vertical y uh, line down to the x-axis. Let's call this angle theta. The circumference of this circle is 2 pi r. Angles and radians start with 0, then go to pi over 2, which equates to 90 degrees. Pi equates to 180 degrees, and 3 pi over 2 equates to 270 degrees. A full revolution is 2 pi. The height of this line is the y value of the point on our circle. It's also the opposite side of the triangle we set up here. Opposite over hypotenuse is the sine of the angle theta. The hypotenuse is the radius r. The length of this line is the x value of the point in our circle. It's also the adjacent side. The cosine of theta is the adjacent over the hypotenuse r. Solving for y, we get y equals r sine theta. Likewise, solving for x, we get x is r cosine theta. Here are the polar coordinates for the point P. r is the distance from the origin, and theta is the angle between the line segment defined by r and the horizontal axis. The Cartesian coordinate system is so conventional, you're going to find that we ultimately will plot points with x and y coordinates. Converting from r and theta is done this way. The x coordinate is r cosine theta. The y coordinate is r sine theta. Here I want to talk about how we refer to points. Let's start with the unit circle. Let's put a point on the circle and call it P. The Cartesian coordinates for P are X and Y. That's one way we refer to the point P. Let's draw a line from the origin to that point and put, the arrow, put an arrow at the end of it. This is called the position vector for P. A vector has magnitude and direction. The magnitude or length of this vector is R, which for a circle is the radius. The vector forms an angle with the x-axis. We'll call that theta. The polar coordinates for this point P is R comma theta. The function for the length of the position vector is expressed as r of theta equals r. For a circle, this is a trivial formula. For ellipses, this formula gets a lot more complex, and I'll talk about ellipses later. Vectors are expressed as bold characters. They can also be expressed this way with a little arrow on top, although this is more typical with handwritten text. Vectors have both length and direction. Theta specifies the direction. The length of r is expressed this way. You either put the vector notation between vertical lines or express r as a non-bold italicized character. This is called the scalar quantity. It only has magnitude and no direction. You see a lot of this notation in the orbital dynamics textbooks. The magnitude of r could have been negative. If that were the case, the vector r would point in the opposite direction. You can achieve the same thing by using the, a positive value for r and adding pi radians to theta.
Here I'm showing you some angles on the unit circle. The basic angles are zero, pi over two, which equates to 90 degrees, pi, which equates to 180 degrees, and three pi over two, which equates to 270 degrees. And then finally two pi, which equates to 360 degrees. Pi over six equates to 30 degrees, pi over four equates to 45 degrees, and pi over three equates to 60 degrees. I'm showing a blue line segment where theta equals pi over four, or 0 0.78 radians. The cosine of theta is 0 0.71, and the sine of theta is also 0 0.71. Notice that the thin magenta line segments labeled cosine and sine are equal in length. If I move the line segment to an angle of zero, the cosine of theta is one and the sine of theta is zero. This makes sense since the x component of this point is one and the y component is zero. If I change the angle to pi over two, now the cosine of theta is zero and the sine of theta is one. If I go back to pi over four, the cosine and sine are 0 0.71. What about pi over six? Here, the cosine of theta is 0 0.87 and the sine of theta is 0 0.5. At pi over three, the cosine of theta is now 0 0.5 and the sine of theta is 0 0.87. I'm gonna sweep through three pi over four, five pi over four, and seven five pi over four quickly. Notice how the cosine and sine are both 0 0.71 but are sometimes negative and sometimes positive. At an angle of 3 pi over 2, the cosine is 0 and the sine is negative 1. At an angle of pi over 2, the cosine is 0 and the sine is 1. The cosine was 0 in both cases. The same thing happens the cosine function when I go from an angle of pi to an angle of zero or two pi. Here I want to express theta as a negative angle. At a negative pi over two angle, the cosine is zero and the sine is minus one. At minus pi, the cosine is minus one and the sine is zero. At three pi over two, the cosine is zero and the sine is one. And at two pi, the cosine is one and the sine is zero. In general, um, as you can see in the equations in the upper right, the sine of minus theta is the same as minus the sine of theta and the cosine of minus theta is the same as the cosine of theta. Here's some value, values of some of the angles on the unit circle. In general, you can get the values of trig functions like cosine and sine with a calculator. These angles, however, have some interesting values that can be derived geometrically. The sine of zero is the same as the sine of zero radians and it equals zero. Remember that the sine is the length of the y component on the unit circle. The sine of 30 degrees is the same as the sine of pi over six and equals one half. I'll show you how we derive that in a minute. The sine of 45 degrees is the same as the sine of pi over four and it equals the square root of two over two. I'll derive this in a minute as well. The sine of 60 degrees is the same as the sine of pi over three and it equals the square root of three over two. And the sine of 90 degrees is the same as the sine of pi over two, and it equals the square root of four over two, which equals two over two, which equals one. So notice the pattern here. The first is the square root of zero over two, the second is square root of one over two, the third is the square root of two over two, and so on. In general, the cosine of theta equals the sine of pi over two minus theta, and the sine of theta equals the cosine of pi over two over theta. And I'll show you in a couple slides um, why this is true. Here I'm gonna drive the sine of pi over four. Recall that h squared 
equals a squared plus b squared. This is the Pythagorean theorem. Since this is a unit circle, h equals 1, theta equals pi over 4. When theta equals pi over 4, the two lengths a and b are equal. Theta is a 45 degree angle, and it bisects the 90 degree angle formed by the x and y axis. So I can simplify the Pythagorean theorem as h squared equals 2a squared. If I divide both sides by 2, I get that a squared equals h squared over 2. a thus equals h squared over 2. Um, a thus equals the square root of h squared over 2. It technically equals plus or minus h, the square root of h squared over 2. We're going to keep the angle within the upper right-hand quadrant, hence a will never be negative. So we can ignore the negative part. Since h equals 1, um, a equals the square root of 1 half, and that equals the square root of 1 over 2. We can uh, take the square root out of the denominator by multiplying this fraction by the square root of 2 over the square root of 2, which equals 1. And that equals the square root of 2 over 2. Since the sides a and b are equal, the sine of pi over 4 equals the cosine of pi over 4, which equals the square root of 2 over 2. Here I'm going to derive the sine and cosine of pi over 3. Again, according to Pythagoras, h squared equals a squared plus b squared. Since this is a unit circle, h equals 1. Theta equals pi over 3. If you look at the figure, you'll notice that a equals 1 half or 0 0.5. Look at the light blue line. It forms an equilateral triangle with the thicker blue line and the x-axis. The magenta line b bisects the angle at the top of the equilateral triangle. Since B is a bisector, it divides the base of the equilateral triangle in half. We know that the base equals 1 because this is a unit circle. Hence, the length of A is 1 half. Plugging in values to the Pythagorean theorem, we have that 1 squared equals 1 half squared plus B squared. B squared thus equals 1 minus 1 half squared. 1 half squared is 1 fourth. Um, so B squared equals 1 minus 1 fourth. b squared thus equals 3 fourths. b thus equals the square root of 3 fourths. And we're going to keep the angle in the upper quadrant where b is positive, so we don't have to worry about the case where b equals minus the square root of 3 fourths. This equation is to the square root of 3 over the square root of 4, and that equals the square root of 3 over 2. The sine of pi over 3 is the square root of 3 over 2, and the cosine of pi over 3 equals 1 half. How about pi over 6? In this case, the equilateral triangle from the previous derivation is tilted sideways. We can simply swap a for b and b for a. The cosine of pi over 6 is thus equal to the square root of 3 over 2, and the sine of pi over 6 is thus equal to 1 half. And as I said before, in general, the sine of theta equals the cosine of pi over 2 minus theta. Theta over 2 is 90 degrees, so if you um, take theta over 2 minus pi, you get the mirror image of the sine and cosine functions. And the cosine of theta equals the sine of theta over 2 minus theta. In this case, we uh, derived earlier pi over 3 equals theta minus pi over 6. Now I want to show you some trigonometric identities. This is a circle with a point P and a position vector R. The vector has the length of R and forms an angle theta with a horizontal axis. The function R of theta equals R. What this equation says is that the length of the vector R is R for any given value of theta. That's the same thing as saying a circle is a shape that has constant radius. As I said previously, this equation will get more complex when we consider ellipses. In the next few equations here, r will represent the function r of theta. r is a shorthand that's pretty conventional. Like I said before, the x component of p is r cosine theta, which means that x is r cosine theta. The y component of p is r sine theta, which means that y equals r sine theta. The Pythagorean theorem tells us that r squared equals x squared plus y squared. We can substitute r cosine theta for y and r sine theta. I'm sorry, r cosine theta for x and r sine theta for y. That gives us r squared equals r cosine theta squared plus r sine theta squared.
we can factor out r squared on the right hand side and then we're going to divide both sides of the equation by r squared. 1 equals cosine squared theta plus sine squared theta. That's one identity. The cosine squared and sine squared notation is equivalent to this, cosine squared theta and plus sine squared theta. The tangent is defined as the opposite over the adjacent. That's y over x. We can substitute r sine theta for y and r cosine theta for x. Um, a over A equals 1, so tan theta reduces the sine theta over cosine theta. That's another trigonometric identity. I want to show you a simple geometric derivation of the chord function. Note the angle theta on this circle. The chord of theta is this line segment here. It forms an isosceles triangle. If I draw a line from the center of the circle that's perpendicular to the chord, it bisects the angle theta. The length of this red line segment is a sine of theta over 2. Since the perpendicular line segment bisected theta, the chord of length of theta is thus 2 times the sine of theta over 2. This is true for a unit circle. If this circle had a radius, the chord would be r times the chord function, or r times 2 times the sine of theta. I'm going to show you um, and derive for you numerous equations in this course. You'll find when you study the algebra that you'll make mistakes here and there, as I surely did. This is the Wolfram Alpha Web homepage. It's a computational knowledge engine or answer engine developed by a subsidiary of Wolfram Research. You can enter equations into this website and it'll graph them for you. Here I'm graphing an equation for a circle. I can change the radius and can change the center point. When I did plus three here, I moved the center to the left and I always get confused. Do you add three or subtract three if you want to move the center? This website's really helpful in um, figuring out how those equations actually work. The website also works with polar coordinates and it has simple functions that will plot things like circles. Here's an equation for a circle in polar coordinates. Some of the more entailed equations we use in orbital dynamics don't work on this site. That's okay. This is a very quick way to test out the simpler stuff. You can plot things with a graph and calculator. I find this site easier. Here I'm going to show you how to plot circles in Excel. This is how you do it with rectangular xy coordinates. A circle is any point that satisfies the equation r squared equals x squared plus y squared. If you solve for y, you get y equals plus or minus the square root of r squared minus x squared. Here with Excel, I've set up a table with a step value from minus 1 to plus 1. The x value is the radius times the step function. You can see if I change the radius, I change the size of the circle. The y value is the square root of r squared minus x squared. And I do the positive version of that and the negative version of that. You can see the graph on the left. I only get half a circle if I plot plus y. So to get a full circle, I have to plot both plus y and minus y. This is a really cumbersome way to plot a circle. In fact, what I'm really doing here is plotting two half circles. 
this method doesn't work well with the more advanced stuff we'll need to do in orbital dynamic. This works much better with polar coordinates. Recall that we can convert from polar coordinates uh, to rectangular coordinates by multiplying r times the cosine of theta to get x and r times the sine of theta to get y. Here I've set up a table and theta goes from 0 to 2 pi. R is the radius. And the x column is r cosine theta. And the y column is r sine theta. The graph on the right is an Excel scatter plot that plots x and y values. I chose the option that draws a line between each of the points. If I change the radius, I change the size of the circle. Polar coordinates make this much easier to plot and understand. You can see from this example that with Excel, you have to set up a table of values if you want to plot them. Excel is a wonderful program, but it's not the best at doing this. Later on, I'm going to show you some animations. This can be done in Excel, but there are far better ways. If you have access to MATLAB, that's a good program to use. If you're not a student, however, it's very expensive. A free version, a free alternative is Python, and it comes in many forms. According to the website, Paizo is a free and open source computing environment based on Python. If you're used to MATLAB, Paizo can be considered a free alternative. I'm showing you the website here. It has instructions for you um, for how to download Python that comes with several math and scientific extensions. It also includes the Python integrated data environment, which lets you edit and run Python code. I'm going to show you how to plot a circle in Python using Paizo. Python is an interpretive language, meaning I can enter commands interactively. First, I need to import NUMPY, numeric package, and matplotlib, which is the MATLAB-like package. And I do that with these import commands. Next, I'm going to set up a variable called theta. This command sets up theta as a one-dimensional matrix with a range from 0 to 2 pi in 0 0.1 increments, step increments. If I type theta in the command line, Python shows me what's stored inside. This is the plot command. I'm telling Python that I want to plot the cosine of all the theta values and the sine of all the corresponding theta values. Plot show displays the plot. And you can see I got a circle. This is very similar to what I did in Excel, except the code is much more compact. In both cases, Python and Excel, I had to set up a table of values. This Python configuration with matplotlib is set up to handle matrices. And what I did with theta was a one-dimensional matrix. MATLAB is set up in a, consider in a similar way. I don't have to type these commands interactively. I can enter the whole sequence on the left and then can execute them as a file. Notice there's a little gap on the circle. That's a gap between 0 and 2 pi. I can fix that by adding a tenth to the maximum value. I'd like to be able to change the radius. I can create a radius variable and then use it on the plot command. Now x is radius times the cosine of theta, and y is the radius times the sine of theta.
Notice that the circle looks like an ellipse. I can fix that by adjusting the figure size. And now I have a nice circle. MATLAB lets me control the axis. The defaults here are pretty good, but I'll show you how that's done. It's done with the PLT axis command. And I added a border variable and an axis size variable. I can also display a grid. And the controls in figure one let me move the graph left, right, up, and down. I can zoom in and zoom out. I can change the size of the window, etc. In future parts of this course, I'm going to show you animations where I'll have planets or satellites traveling along ellipses. This Python configuration is set up to do that very easily. I want to introduce you to Visual Python. When we get into the physics that underlies orbital dynamics, we use force equations to derive orbital and suborbital trajectories. Visual Python is set up to do that. Glowscript.org is now maintaining Visual Python, and their documentation is here. You can download a Visual Python environment like I did with Paizo. Paizo runs on Python version 2. Visual Python runs on Python version 3. If you don't want to download Visual Python and Python 3, you can run Visual Python with a web app in Glowscript. Here I have some code that simulates two planets orbiting each other. I'm not going to explain this code just yet. Um, but despite that, you can see it's not too complicated, and yet it simulates pretty complex orbital motion. You can set this up in, Matplot, in uh, Matplotlib, but it gets pretty messy. I imagine, too, you could do it in MATLAB. Um, Visual Python was actually made for this, and the code is actually quite simple. The key things I want you to take away from this part are the two coordinate systems, rectangular and polar. For orbital dynamics, we prefer to use the polar coordinate system, and we use the rectangular one as the last step. Angles are expressed in radians. That makes the algebra we're going to do much simpler. We use a lot of trig functions. I'll get into more um, advanced trig identities later. And remember that the transformation of polar coordinates is to, rec to rectangular is r cosine theta for x, and r sine theta for y. And we like to express radians as the number of pi radians. And then lastly, check out the Python, Python Pizo bundle and Visual Python. These tools are invaluable for doing your own calculations.